When Prabhupada came to um, Detroit, it was uh, Bhagavan's son. We could turn this down just a touch, which means that they then turn it off. But let's just, a touch means just a little bit. So uh, his son, Vaishnav, was about, oh, I don't know, three years old, four years old, and he'd never seen Srila Prabhupada. So, you know, a little kid, it's like Santa Claus or something. So, uh, Prabhupada was chanting Jai Radha Madhav in the, for the Bhagavatam class in the morning, the old temple. Had a marble floor like this. And, uh, you know, they call them a onesie, you know, that they, it's got the feet and zip, zips up the front, right, you know? So his mother had cleaned him up, brushed his teeth, had tilak on, and he came running, he, you know, he heard Prabhupada chanting, came running into the temple room, packed full of devotees, and there was a little marble mantle or whatever you call that, and he tripped on it, didn't hurt himself. But he, he was running, and he landed on the floor like this. And you can imagine, he had momentum. So it's a, it's a bird, it's a plane. No, it's Vaishnava. Zip! He slipped all the way across the floor and stopped right in front of Srila Prabhupada's view. had slid like from, you know, from Shrestri all the way to me. And he just stopped. And he was lying down like this flat, because he had the ones he just Prabhupada looked down, everyone looked, Prabhupada looked down, Prabhupada said, ah, utsaha. First Prabhupada said, dandavats, because he was, <laughs> and then Prabhupada said, utsaha, that enthusiasm, Prabhupada said, one must be enthusiastic to advance in devotional service, so I appreciate the enthusiasm. That's from Rupa Goswami, of course, utsaha nishcaya daryat. Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Pijana Balava Kirivana Dadi Pijana Balava Kirivana Dadi Jasura Nandana, Jijana Ranjana, Jasura Nandana, Jijana Ranjana, Jamuna Tiravana Jamun te Ravana Tadi Read it up Jai Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hadi Kopi Jana Balava Divana Dadi Jasodanandana Jajana Ranjana Jamuna Tira Munatari Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 
Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Krishna Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Jaya Radha Madhava, Kundabi Hari. Jaya Radha Madhava, Kundabi Hari. Jaya Radha Madhava Kundabi Hari Radha Madhava Kundabi Hari Jai Um Vishnu Pad Paramahansi Pari Bajikacharya Sita Shish Majesty One Grace Abhai Chodan Bhakti Vedanta Swami Maharaj Srila Prabhupada Found the rich eye. Oh, Jagu Guru Shila Prabhupada ki. Ananta Kura Vaishnava Brinda ki. Nam Charaj Prahidas Tam ki. Prem Shikaho Shri Krishna Chaitana Prabhu Nithin Anda Shri Advaita Gadara Shiva Sadi Go Bhakti Brinda ki. Shashi Radhakrishna Go Gopinath Shama Kunda Radhakunda Kiri Govardhan ki. Brindavan Dham ki. Matur Dham ki. Yorka Dhamma ki, Navadi Dhamma ki, Jagannathpuri Dhamma ki, Jamuna Maya ki, Ganga Maya ki, Tulsi Maharani ki, Bhakti Deva ki, Sambhita Bhakti Vinda ki, Srila Prabhupada ki, Sesidhari ki, Shri Krishna San Kirtana Jaga ki, Gopri Manandi, Oh glorious the sum of devotees, Oh glorious the sum of devotees, Oh glorious the sum of devotees, Oh, glory to find on the feet of Shri Shri Guru and Gauranga. We should put wheels on this thing. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So, being as we're at a juncture in our reading of the Bhagavatam, 
we're finishing one chapter and starting another. And the next chapter is the chapter we're starting. I think Balaram did one or two verses yesterday. Is the, titled the uh, Prayers by the Inhabitants of Jambu Dweep. Um, I was reading those prayers, and and there's a thread. I guess just so you don't have to sit there, we could go ahead and shut the lights off. The there's many threads or themes, but and one of the themes is that. As you go up higher in the universe, in the planetary systems, they're all glorifying Krishna as the key to their success. The further you go down, the more they're ignoring Krishna and trying to, like Adolf Hitler took the Vedic swastika and tilted it. It goes my way. It represents the swastika amongst other things, auspiciousness, invokes auspiciousness, and it represents one of the things that everything is turning and the center is around Krishna. Everything rests upon, is sustained by, maintained, and revolves around Krishna. So it goes my way. And this is the theme as we go further and further down, and what is the result of that? So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit here. I wanted to go into a little bit of history. So I think it'll sort itself out. I threw this, this together last night, and, uh, but I hope you'll get a little something out of it. Okay, so we're starting off with the... Anyone know this pastime? What happened? What happened is Krishna went out with, with a few grains of rice. Something wanted to barter and get a little fruit from the fruit. And you still have this in India. You have it a lot of places in the developing world where they don't all go down to the mall or order from Amazon. The, um, yeah, the street vendors go by and they all have their unique call, their sound, you know, and they're selling, you know, Whatever it is, you got the milk guys got a sound, the fruit guys got a sound, the vegetables, and they, they walk down the street with their carts and they make their calls. So the fruit vendor was going through by Nanda Maharaja's palace, where, you know, compound, and Krishna, as he'd seen his parents do, went out with a little bit of grains to purchase some fruit. And, you know, small child, everything's falling through the fingers and out of his little hands. And so when he opened his hands, there's a few grains, nothing really of any purchase power. But she was so charmed, she's giving him nice, ripe mangoes. But in this exchange, Krishna is getting a few mangoes. What is she getting? We all know, if you look in the basket that was carrying her fruit, the whole basket has been changed from fruit into jewelry, jewels. The point being, of course, there's many points, but one of the points is that if we just purely give to Krishna without any expectation of return, our benefit is, cannot even be estimated. So people are all worried about maintaining themselves and creating an economic system. You'll see why this makes sense in a moment. But creating an ex economic system that will support them and maintain them. But they don't understand some sit he haritoshanam, as the Bhagavatam says. The perfection is the pleasing, the supreme personality of Godhead. There's the saying, if you protect Dharma, Dharma will protect you. What is the conclusion of Bhagavad Gita? Na sucha, don't fear, don't hesitate, don't doubt, just surrender. And Krishna will take care of everything. So that's, you'll see where we're going here. But that's the theme, because as we go up in the universe, those that have greater opulence, greater longevity, greater happiness, greater culture, to the degree that they're actually surrendered to Krishna, these opulences come just as dawn follows the sun. Next. Thanks. So this is from Queen Kunti. And 
I will read. This is from the first canto, chapter 8, text 40. All these cities and villages are flourishing in all respects. And what is the measure? Because the herbs and grains are in abundance, the trees are full of fruit, the rivers are flowing, the hills are full of minerals, and the oceans are full of wealth. It's said that when it rains, it is, if it rains at a right auspicious time, if it rains in the hills, it becomes jewels, and if it rains in the ocean, it becomes pearls. It has to be the right astrological arrangement. So all of these things are full of wealth, and this is all due to your glancing over them. That's the active principle that Krishna's glancing over them. Next. And from Prabhupada's purport. The natural gifts, such as grains and vegetables, fruits, rivers, hills of jewels and minerals, and seas full of pearls, are supplied by the order of the Supreme. And as he desires, material nature produces them in abundance or resp restricts them at times. The natural law is that human beings may take advantage of these godly gifts by nature and satisfactorily flourish on them. That's the actual way it's supposed to work. Next. And where it was actually being practiced following the Vedas, because I said the secret to the opulence of Vedic India. I didn't say India, Bart, Varsa, Kijai. I didn't say that. I said Vedic, when they were following the Vedic principles. So here's just, an, it's not just theory, it's not just, oh, well, that's wishful thinking, and you've got some romantic fairy tale in your head, and, you know, nobody's really there to check it. But this is just 1500s. This is the, you know, you've got the, anyway, it's a historical significant time. Uh, you've got the Chinese Empire, you've got the Turkish Empire, Persian, whatever you want to call it, so many different empires. And you've got Europe just, you know, getting out of the Dark Ages. It's an opulent time. But let's just compare and contrast. India's gross national product in 1500 was, an esti was estimated at $100 billion for e per year. Hundred billion dollars. Now let's look at Europe, because the picture is that Europe is advanced and you know there's so many different things and India is backward and but the actual situation is France was a distant eighteen billion. So what is that? One fifth? Less than one fifth? Yeah, of what India's and then it really dropped, followed closely by Italy and Germany, and England drops down to twelve billion. So they were like, it was nothing. It was peanuts. It was, it, all right, well, let's have some proof. Next. We know Christopher Columbus, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Um, but where were they all trying? And there was some Vasco da Gama. There were so many Magellan. There were so many guys out there cruising around trying to find. Where were they trying to get to? Where was Columbus trying to get to? He's trying to get to India. They were all trying to. Why? Because it was so incredibly opulent. Here's, you know, here we, they're all cruising. They're all, all their different trade routes. But where are they all going? They're all trying to get to India, Vedic India, where they were following the Vedic principles and worshiping Krishna. Not everyone, but that was the general principle. Next. Uh, this is the main gate of the Red Fort in Delhi which was the capital of the Mughal Empire. This is just the front gate. There's about five or six, I had to think of four or five of these gates, and the whole palace is sunk in the back, right by the Jamuna River, with secret tunnels, all kinds of stuff going on. So this, I mean, you could drop Buckingham Palace in a corner of the, of the Red Fort. Anyway, next. This is Sir John Rowe, the first British ambassador to India. This is the Mughal Emperor right here. This is our Sir John Rowe. And they were just stunned. They couldn't believe it. The opulence, the, the king of Mysore, just one of the, uh, of the Hindu kings, Vedic, Vedic kings. He was actually a Vaishnava. He had free education, free lighting. They had sewer system. The whole thing was completely set up. 
when England there, they're dying from, you know, bubonic plague and so many that you're throwing their waste out the window, passing in a chamber pot. In, they couldn't even believe how opulent it was. There's a, there's a description by the, by the ambassador, because they were all communicating, wasn't they? They didn't know each other. The Chinese Empire was communicating with the, you know, the England and this and that, and the Persians were saying, everybody had ambassadors. The whole thing was, you know, there was a world politic. And uh, there's a letter. This was in 1400, and he's visiting the city of Humpy. You know Humpy? Humpy is, you, know, you see that big Lord Nishringadev with his, you know, he's, you know, he's huge. He's on the top of the hill, and the whole city was, I forget the name of the king. Um, but the whole city was dedicated to Lord Nishingadev. It, it's a whole story. But when you go through the pass to enter the place, there's the high hills covered with rocks. And then when you enter, there's an unbelievably fertile, fertile valley. And that's where his city, Humpy, was. So as you come through that pass to get into the city, there was, what is he? He's probably about 16, 20 feet tall, Lord Nishingadev. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's unbelievable. He's huge. And it describes the marketplace and the, the Portuguese ambassador. I could find, I didn't have a chance to find it, but I've read it before and I can find it. He's describing. And the point is that it's not that it was just theory that if you follow the Vedic, Krishna says, go, you know, with men and demigods follow these juggas and there were mutual, you know, uh, benefit, mutual success. It works. It actually works when you follow it. If you just simply follow the natural laws of God, it actually works. Okay, because I'm thinking about the time. But it describes the marketplaces. You know, like you go to Lloyd Bazaar now, and they got a few funky things. They had rows. I've seen that you can, you can still see the old stone marketplace and all the different stalls. And he's describing, well, this one sold diamonds. This one was full of emeralds and rubies. This was all every spice you could possibly imagine. This one had, you know, Silk, you know, what is it? Banari silk, the best silk in the world. Describe, he, he said, the, the Portuguese ambassador says, and he lists, I've been to London, I've been to Cordoba, I've been to Madrid, I've been to, you know, all the different places he's been. Oh, I've been to Moscow. He said, they all pale before this one marketplace. And every king had a marketplace. Okay, so next. So what happened? Everything was going along great. Where's the opulence? What happened? Next. Um, this is, there was an insidious plot. This is, uh, you'll understand. This is Lord Macaulay. Lord Macaulay was sent back to, to our ambassador. What they were doing is they were begging for a little trade port. Give us a little corner. Give us a little, give us a, just like in China, Hong Kong was started because they didn't want these foul Westerners that bathe once a week, they didn't really want them in their kingdom with all their nasty habits. So they, but they wanted a little trade. So they'd give them a trade port. So same thing in India. They gave, you know, the French got was Pondicherry, what it's called. The Portuguese got Goa. They gave them a little seaport, you know, but you can't come inland. We don't want your bad habits. You've got your own, the foreign quarter. <laughs> the king of Jayapur, um, he built a, a palace. It's a beautiful palace. It's outside his compound. It's now a museum. And he said, oh, you can stay here. I built a palace for you. And that because the Brits were coming, the French, the, uh, the sun. You know why? He didn't want anybody staying in his palace who ate meat and smoke and drank. So he said, oh, you can stay out here. I've made a whole beautiful park for you. Actually, it's like, you know, you'd let some smelly bum. Well, you stay out in the patio. You, st you know, stay out in the patio. So they give him these little trading ports. So here's the first row, the, the first British ambassador to India, and he's begging the king, who's just this whole, this is, this is called the peacock throne. This throne is solid gold and embedded with jewels. It was embedded with jewels. Later on, it wound up, and it's a whole story what happened to it. But, you know, the Queen of England's got a few... You know, by now it seems amazing, but she's got a few rubies, a few emeralds, and a crown on her head. In fact, this peacock throne was ultimately melted down, and some of those jewels are in the British crown. 
But this whole thing is solid gold and embedded with diamond crusted. So this British, and he's begging, can we just have a little port? Give us one place that we can do the whole trade with you. Oh, all right. Okay, next. So now, so what happened? Now, they set up the East India Company. Because this, this trend, you'll see as this trend unfolds, happened everywhere all over the world. From a grain of rice, you can understand the pot. So this is the insidious slide into Kali Yuga, the dependence on materialism and economic development, which has killed the finer sentiments of the living beings. We'll get more into it, but this is just a sample. So this is Lord Macaulay. Lord Macaulay was sent by the East Indian Corporation Company, which is hand in glove with the, with the British Crown. And they were getting different toeholds in India. But they weren't able to change the people, and they weren't really able to take over. So they sent Lord Macaulay, check it out. So this is Lord Macaulay's report. You can see the document to the British uh, Parliament. I've traveled across the length and breadth of India, and I have not seen one person who was a beggar. Now, you've got to think about Dickens. If you, you know, you know uh, what is it? What is uh it was the best of times. It was the worst of Tale of Two Cities, or or you've got you know David Copperfield, or whatever it is, or what's the one everybody knows, um, you know, with the uh, Christmas. What's that called? You know, with the whatever. But the point is that you know the streets are full of filth. People are dying of horrible diseases. So here he says, it beggars in the street. I've traveled across the length and breadth of India, and I have not seen one person who is a beggar, who is a thief. Such wealth I have seen in this country, such high moral values, people of such caliber that I do not think we could ever conquer this country. That was his mission. How do we take over this place? So he said that they have, they're so fixed in their, in their deep Vedic culture and their moral fiber and their opulence because of that. Not a single beggar. I mean, you look at India now, it's a disaster. No offense. Of course, it's getting better materially. Um, so what does he say? Unless we break the very backbone of this nation, which is her spiritual and cultural heritage. He's speaking it. It's a record. It's, it's like open secret. Therefore, I propose that we replace her old and ancient education system, her culture. For if the Indians think that all that is foreign and English is good and greater than their own, they will lose their self-esteem, their native culture, and they'll become what we want them, a truly dominated nation. I mean, is that heavy or what? Break the Vedic tradition stuff them full of meat, get them to drink. You'll see how insidious it gets. Oh, this is all, all your Vedas. These are all fairy tales. There was a book called um, uh, uh, England's Gift to India, and it was all about the railroads, and they built some bridges, and how we've helped unite the country. The only reason they built the railroads in it, previously people walked. They had bullock carts. I saw a bullock cart riding in India. I was driving from Vrindavan to Jayapur. And it was a farmer family and his husband, wife, and a couple children. It was about 6 o'clock in the morning. They were going to the market somewhere. They were all asleep in the hay in the back, conked out completely. And the bull knew. He knew where he was going. Bull did he go. And the bull's just walking along. Do you, have you ever heard of anyone killed by a bullock cart, head-on collision of a bullock cart? One instance of it. No. And smog and petrol and, oh, but now we're advanced. India's, the only reason they built the railroads so they could get all the raw materials, you'll see more about that in a minute, out of India, just rape the place and take it back to the factories of England. Because what do you grow on that tiny little island with, you know, if it wasn't for the, what is it, the trade, the, what do they call that? The, not the trade winds, but there's that uh, cycle, a current that brings warm water up to England. Gulf Stream. If it wasn't for the Gulf Stream, it'd be like Iceland. You look how high north it is. It's up like Canada or above. Huh? It's in Moscow. What is it? It's on the same latitude as Moscow. 
So there it is, you know. Um, I'm just going to read this one more time because this sets the theme. I've traveled across the length and breadth of India, and I have not seen one person who is a beggar, who is a thief. Such wealth I have seen in this country, such high moral values, people of such caliber that I do not think we could ever conquer this country unless we break the very backbone of the nation, which is her spiritual and cultural heritage. Therefore, I propose that we replace her old and ancient educational system, her culture. For if the Indians think that it is foreign and English is good and greater than their own, they'll lose their self-esteem, their native culture, and they will become what we want them a truly dominated nation. Next. And this is Lord Macaulay. Here's the statement you can just see. He's a proper British English uh, gentleman. Next. Um, and this idea of citizens as a resource to exploit. I remember my father, as he was reading Wall Street Journal about China opening up, he said, just think about it. One billion consumer units. So when the people become consumer units and they're just, you know, everything's measured by workload and gross the domestic product, Radhanathan gave a, a talk to the um, Bank of London, the directors of the Bank of London, and he started his talk off about the gross domestic product because that's how you measure advancement. It, 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 what is it? Um, uh, Long-term goods, things that, you know, uh, I forget, durable goods. How many durable goods do you produce? What's the gross national product? We know what all that. He said, well, why don't you measure the gross national happiness? What is the use of your gross domestic product? What, the product is a means to an end. What is the end? And he said, if you look, what are the suicide rate, alcoholism, divorce, abortion, dare I say? How do you measure Gross domestic product, how many washing machines and cars you can produce if they're jumping off a bridge because of frustration. Okay, so just try to understand how insidious it is, how, how we've come to where we are now, how it's creeped in. So I wanted to take one example, the British destruction of the Vedic culture, because as I said, you under, take a grain of rice, you understand the pot. Same thing happened all over the world is the insidious with the, the, with the, the camel with his nose under the tent, before you know it, the whole camel's in your tent, as Kali Yuga progresses. What is it? I think E.E. Uh, e. Cummings, as up they grew, down they went. And that's what's happening. So at first, they set up uh, free tea stands. He said, oh, this is, you know, very, it's healthy. It'll perk you up. They saw, in India, they wouldn't eat tea. It's an intoxication. They weren't drinking it. And the Brits said, hey, look, we're growing tea in India. And then we're bringing it back to London. If only we could get all these people. I don't know what the population of India was at the time, but, you know, it's millions and millions of people. Let's get them addicted. Let's, we got a local market here. So they started passing out on the, on the um, train station. You know, you know, when you get, you know, whatever it is, platform. Um, and they'd mix it with nice milk. Indians like milk. So at night, and they sweeten it. You ever get Indian tea? It's got all kinds. It's got cardamom. It's chai, right? Yeah, chai, chai. We, we all know it. So they're thinking, well, and they're, and they're saying, oh, it's good for your health. And I, sure, I get jacked up. I feel a little, a little caffeine boost. And it's tasty too. So they started, they set up free tea stands at the railway stations. They gave away cups of tea for free. Then when the people were hooked, Oh, lo and behold, no more free. They started to charge. I saw this in, in, in 19, say, 70s. They started passing out free cigarettes on campus for women, on college campuses. Because if you, if whatever brand you get attached to and habits you get attached to in your late teens and early youth stay with you for life. Why do you use fuzzle toothpaste? Well, because that's when you just grew up with it. And you got, you got, you, you know, that was a choice. When you became a young adult, you were cho you chose it. And they gave them like Virginia Slims. Oh, you smoke, it'll help you lose weight. Because women didn't smoke. It was considered a foul habit left alone for men with pipes and cigars. You remember that age. Yeah, women didn't smoke. And they said, look, we're losing half the population. They started passing them out for free. They'd have pretty women on college campuses because they're young and influenced away from their family. And they started passing out free cigarettes. Once they got addicted, 
bing, bing. All of a sudden, you got to pay for the thing. It's insidious. Okay, next. But citizens as work units. Here they've, here they are, the government factory, they were growing opium and distributing opium to people. Here's our guy with the, here's our Brit in charge of the factory with this nice helmet. India's, uh, England's gift to India. Next. Indian ships sailed into London Harbor laden with Indian goods. The British government was shocked. Seeing the potential competition, they systematically destroyed into shipping building, uh, shipbuilding industry by not allowing ships over a certain small size to be used for Indian businesses. They could go, they had, you could build a boat long enough to go up a river or go along the coast, but no seafaring boats. You couldn't produce them. Everything, all the raw material had to go to England and then you had to purchase it, you know, made in England. They shipped it back to you. Gandhi's whole theme with a spinning wheel, you know why that's if you, the Indian flag, it's got the, the spinning wheel? Because why should we ship all of our raw cotton, you'll see more about that in a minute, to Manchester and, and buy it back at a higher cost of an inferior quality and let the profit all go in the pocket of, uh, you know, the, the British uh, gentry? We used to make it at home. So no, 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 no. You can't, you can't trade. We're going to shut it down. Next. Uh, the British broke India's weaving industry. All raw, cot all raw cotton exported to England and, or to Manchester, the mills of Manchester, and then it shipped back as milk cloth, like what I was saying. They cut the thumbs off weavers so that India could not produce its own cloth. India had the best cotton, the largest and the best quality cotton in the world, and the best cotton cloth, Madrasi cloth. It was the best cotton cloth in the world. People hankered it all over the world, and they just killed the industry. Um, thus, the British killed off what had been one of the largest and best quality handloom cotton cloth industries in the world. Next. Just see, here's a happy weaver at home, the doors open, nice, fresh, tropical breezes. Kids are playing, little snack items, not tea, and weaving happily. And what, what happens? This is what they produce. As soon as they got the steam engine, man, they started these huge looms, hundreds of people slaving away the industrial age. Prophet said factory is another name for hell. So where do you want to be? Happy? And you produce it. You put your personal labor, your personal artistry into it. You have a sense of fulfillment, a sense of satisfaction. You have some intellectual and architectural expression, you know, aesthetic expression. Instead, you just work like a cog in a wheel. I met a guy one time in Detroit, you know, factory Detroit. I said, that, the guy said he worked at the River Rouge Stamping Factory. There's a, when you drive from Detroit to Toronto, there's a bridge you go over and you go right over the uh, River Rouge stamping factory where they, you know, make Ford Motor Company. It's Ford Motor Company. And at night, just like Prabhupada said, it looks like it was Hieronymus Bosch, one of those, you know, picture of hell. It's got all this flames and wheels and people running around and smells horrible. It's called the armpit of the nation. Just nasty. It's all dark, working around the clock, three shifts, eight-hour shifts. So um, there it is, factory and the name for hell. Okay, next. And this is Aurobindo. We do not belong to the dusks of the past, but the dawns of the future. When I arrived in Calcutta for the first time, got off the plane, coming out of the airport, 1973. But it's the same thing. This guy was 18-something. Um, there's a big billboard, and this is what it said. We do not belong to the dusk of the past, but the dawns of the future. What does that mean? What is, it, what is the subliminal message there? It's, it's, it's the sun is set on it. It's, it's dusk. It's old fashioned. It's, it's primitive. It's uncivilized, unsophisticated. Give it all up. And what do you belong to? The dawn of the future. Sounds great, doesn't it? 
bright, fresh, going to... No, you're being turned into a gerbil that has to work in one of these horrible factories where you're nothing more than a work unit. New York tenements working all slaving away, bring over that free labor and sweat it out of them. Sweatshops, they called them. That's what's happened to the world. And it turns out that he was paid by the British to teach karma yoga. Work hard to make India into an industrial state and we'll cream off all the profit. It's horrible. I was going to say something. I'm just trying to think about. Anyway, let's go next because of the time factor. Now, what is the answer? Shila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. Here he's meeting. This is with the governor, the uh, governor of Bengal, British governor. And, uh, you know, his servant is there. Shila Bhakti, this is a radio, by the way. This is the old coil radios making a recording of their talk. And um, this was distributed as a poster. And Shila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur titled it across the bottom. I'll get it. I, I, I chopped it out for something else. But the title was Western Civilization Must Be Crushed. That was Srila Bhakti said, and we'll get into it in just a second. Next. And Prabhupada says that first purport I read with Queen Kunti, this is in Prabhupada's purport. The Jagya, just try to see how prescient, how into the future, how relevant to today, how the actual, you know, what they call it, um, uh, uh, birds, not bird's eye view, you know, when you fly up and look down, the actual comprehensive cause and solution of the problems of the world. Prabhupada's writing alone in Vrindavan, writing in his Bhagavatam, the gigantic industrial enterprises are products of a godless civilization. Remember they said, kill your Vedic tradition. Forget it, all your culture. Because here's the thing. In India, they, they didn't, only the king lived in a big house. You know, I have a small house. Every house had a, you know, a farmer had a compound out in front. You know, we had kept your cows, you had a little garden, you had your fruit trees. Your kids could play safely. That's culture. Now we're all stacked on the you know, Trump Tower, like rats stacked on each other. He probably calls them a pigeonhole in a skyscraper building. And that's sophisticated? So anyway, I'll read. Gigantic industrial enterprises are products of a godless civilization, and they cause the destruction of the noble aims of human life. They destroy the noble aims of human life. Dog eat dog. Get to the top. The more we go on increasing such troublesome industries to squeeze out the vital energy of the human being. Across the River Rouge stamping factory, that Ford company factory, I swear to you, you see lined up, at least when I was there in the 70s, there was a, you know, a quick pay loan, there was the bars, there was the card places, there were prostitutes, there was buy now, pay later. So you see these guys come out in their overalls completely black from working in the tire factory or the, you know, and whatever little, and they, especially after payday, and they just squeeze it out of them. They lose it by gambling, by drinking, by prostitutes. It's horrible. So squeeze out the vital energy of the human being. The more there will be unrest and dissatisfaction of the people in general, although a few only can live lavishly by exploitation. I mean, Prabhupada just completely nails it in a paragraph. Next. You see this? It says lunch break. <laughs> That's what we've been turned into, week, work units, just to be exploited. Turn them upside down and shake them till everything comes out of their pocket and then run them through a grinder so there's no vitality left. Next. The 1% versus the 99%. This current generation of young people, 20 years old, 18 to 25 or whatever it is, it's the first generation in American history who will have a lower standard of life than their parents. They have to wait till they're 30 to get married because they don't have the money to support a family. There's more people for the first time that, that are you know, getting out of college and starting their life in that range. They're renting. They're living with their parents. They're renting because they can't afford to buy a house. A house is your first point of economic advancement. Instead of throwing your money, if you're a householder, instead of throwing your money for rent, 
you somehow or other get a house and then that's permanent income and it in increases in value if something happens to the father or the whatever the fan you sell the house you've got some money it's it's everybody you would borrow against the house it's and now they're just renting they've got no traction to, to go up the economic ladder it's a, it's just a vicious Oh, and they, on top of it, they graduated a huge college debt. So it sucks in so many ways. The American, this is from Dave and Rita Marsh to give credit. You know the American dream, right? That you, you, you work hard, you're honest, you work hard, and you're going to be able to retire with a house, paid off with a pension. Pensions don't even, pensions are gone, my friends. They, you put it all in an IRA. We don't have to pay for it. You put it in an IRA. And we'll put a little few pennies in there to get it going, you know? And then you're on your own. So why do they call it the American? Because you, sh you, you should be able to put two kids through college, have a house that's paid off, and have a pension, and have free medical care via Medicaid. That's the American dream, man. Forget it. It's all gone. The American dream, this is Dave Why do they call it the American dream? Because you have to be asleep to believe it. Next. But there's an alternative. Wait, wait. We're not going to leave you in dark. Here's this guy, your average American, schlepping along, you know. <laughs> you know, it's just the nasty, this typical place. You know, who wants, nobody wants the vacation here. But this sign says scenic area. And you look, oh, wait a minute. There's a whole other reality out there. So there is an alternative. And let's see what it is. Yeah. This is, again, this is from Pro, another purple by Sherla Prabhupada. On the other hand, that literature, which is full of description of the transcendental glories of the name, form, fame, form, and pastimes of the Supreme Lord, unlimited Supreme Lord, is a transcendental creation meant to bring about, this is the key thing, a revolution in the impious life of a misguided civilization. Wait a minute. I'm not getting on that conveyor belt to hell. I'm not doing it. I'm not going to be a work unit and exploited. There's another way to live. There's a whole other set of values. Back to the Vedic culture. And let me please Krishna. And let me have some freedom and fresh air and creativity and independence. Next. Prabhupada nails it. This Bhagavatam is as brilliant as the sun. Persons who have lost their vision to the dense darkness of ignorance in the age of Kali shall get light out of this Purana. I mean, here it is. I mean, and, and there's that purple prophecy that describes Kali Yuga. What is it? Bickering, pilfering, this whole list, you know, of, of, of all the petty qualifications, quedi, petty qualities of human beings now. But the Bhagavatam, the light of the Bhagavatam is the alternative, the whole different reality. Next. We're almost done. So distributing the message of the Bhagavatam. That's what will change the world. It's not the latest five-year plan or the World Bank or, or you know, throw out the, the, uh, the conservatives and put in the liberals, throw out the liberals, put in the, you know, that, none of that's going to work. It's not a, the latest, you know, the, what is it, the uh, G20 and then there's the G7, you know, the top industrial nations. That's not going to do it. Bhagavatam will do it. So I, I love this. This is in Balboa Park. You never know who will get a book. Next. Maybe you know these two fellows. This is our Deva Vrata Prabhu, and this is our own Dimitri. I don't know what this is, a ray of sunlight. It, so they caught it in the picture. It's just like, you know, <laughs> Lord Chaitanya is pouring down some special mer mercy. So next. In other words, go back. This is our mission. We can completely turn the tide. That's our job. Prophet said, my disease is I cannot think small. The whole society, the whole world has been turned into, just, you know, like hamsters on a wheel and to work units and exploited. And they get a few crumbs at the end of the day. And everybody's just, well, that's the American dream. And what alternative? And, that's, and they're just shoveling down, you know, off the cliff like lemmings. Unless they get Bhagavatam. Okay, next. This is from Chaitanya Charitam Rita. These are prayers by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It's from the first, I, for, I forgot exactly, I didn't put the, but it's the, um, 
Adi Lila. Lord Chaitanya is speaking about the Sankatan mission. And he's speaking to all of us. Distribute this Krishna consciousness movement all over the world. Let people eat these fruits and ultimately come free from old age and death. Next. All the wealth in the three worlds cannot equal the value of one such nectarian fruit of devotional service. Giving that, let me measure my life by how have I pleased Krishna and the happiness that comes from that. Instead of what is your happiness? Oh, I got something from Walmart or I, you know, my something from Amazon or, you know, I got a, whatever it is. I got a promotion. I got a corner office. How long does that last? Next. It is the duty of every living being to perform welfare activities for the benefit of others with his life, wealth, intelligence, and words. It is up to us. Like they used to say that, what, uh, I forget, well, I didn't want to quote it, but you know, what is the last, America is the last great hope of the world. Actually, the Sankatan mission and book distribution, what else is going to turn this tide? Just like the moon controls the tides. So the moon of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Gaur Chandra, that will turn the tide of Kali Yuga. Otherwise, it's all dark and downhill. And there's people out there day and night who are thinking how to shake your money, how to turn you into a work unit, and how to squeeze your life blood out of you. The 1% is scheming. And the 99% is just dumb. Like, you know, Prophet says goats are lined up to go to the slaughterhouse. And the one is being butchered and the other was eating grass. Think, well, that's him, not me. Dream on. Okay, so I think this is our last slide. Next. Yeah. Prabhupada appeals in so many places, please help me. This is our family business. Prabhupada said, I can't think small. Prabhupada said, there's one thing that is because sannyasis are supposed to be tolerant. I'm working on it. <clears throat> They're supposed to be tolerant. What is the one thing? That a sannyasi cannot tolerate. And Prabhupada says it in the Bhagavatam. It is the sound, Prabhupada joke, it's a crying baby. No, but the Prabhupada said it is the sound of the conditioned souls being crushed by the material nature. They can't stand it. We can't, if, if, how can you eat in someone starving right on your doorstep? So this is our family business, and we have a, it, it, it's a full engagement. Gunagra, well, the interior, Gunagrai Maharaj, they don't say it so much, because now they, they realize the devotees are happy and they're suffering. But they used to say, and every now and then someone will say, they see a devotee, they see a Harinam party, and they'll yell as they're off their way to, on their way to the, fe I was going to mention the guy at the Fender Bender factory. When I was in Detroit, he worked at the River Rouge stamping factory. Nice guy, bought a book. This is some many years ago. And I said, what do you do? He said, oh, I work at the River Rouge stamping factory. I said, what do you do? He said, I, he said, frankly, I don't know. He said, I put, the sh I put the sheet of metal in. I pull the lever. When it comes out, it's all bent to hell. That's what he does all day long. He's making probably bumpers or side, you know, the side door to a car or, or hoods. Who knows? Stick the metal in, wham! Stick the metal in, wham! Stick the metal in, wham! All day long. For 40 years. Eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, 50 weeks, get two weeks off. Maybe with pay if you're lucky. What does that do to the consciousness? It turns you into just a malleable, blind unit. It has to go on and stupefy yourself with television or cable and, and drink. That's what it turns you into. So we have the way to turn it. We have everything. We have the, Prabhupada told me, he was speaking to a group of devotees, I was there. Prabhupada said, um, I've given you the structure. How did he say it? Oh, I'm trying to remember. I can't believe it. Prophet said, I've given you the structure. All you have to do is decorate it. Then he paused and said, actually, I've given you the decorations. Just go and hang them. All we have to do is go and hang them. We've got prashadam. You know, we've got the harinam. We've got book distribution. We've got festivals. We've got beautiful temples. We have Krishna prashadam. Come on, just be a human being. That's all we ask. Okay, so there it is. That's the, 
what's happening to the world, the insidious slide, and they're scheming out there day and night. And we have a duty to be the white knights giving Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mercy and deliver these people. And they're hungry for it. Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hey, Gokin. They're making plans how to turn people into hamsters and gerbils. Shouldn't we be making plans? You know, you go out on Harinam and people say, get a job. So Kunagrang Marsh was never one to back down from a challenge. Somebody said, hey, get a job. Kunagrang Marsh said, I've got a job. Guy said, what's that? Mara said, saving you. And it's not easy. <laughs> the guy was, he couldn't believe it. His friends were all laughing, you know. But we've got a job. We've got the most important job. And the best friend, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Thanks.